Hi, and welcome to another Austin Software Cooperatives Meetup. Um, we're going to be continuing with a book review of Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. We got through chapter five the last time, so go check that out. We're going to jump back into chapter six and continue from there. It's all yours, Watson. All right, chapter six, Bend the Reality. So one of the themes of the book is going against the grain of the traditional negotiation, which would be the getting the yes, getting past no, principled, what's called principled negotiation. So compromising. And he uses a, uh, an illustration here uh, that I, th I thought was kind of um, powerful. So here, to make my point on compromise, let me paint you an example. A woman wants her husband to wear black shoes with his suit, but her husband doesn't want to. He prefers brown shoes. What? So what do they do? They compromise. They meet halfway, and you guessed it, he wears one black and one brown shoe. Is this the best outcome? No. In fact, that's the worst possible outcome. Either of the two other outcomes, black or brown, would be better than the compromise. So this never split the difference kind of goes along the lines of this compromising um, and avoiding compromise. The win mindset pushed by so many negotiation experts is usually ineffective and often disastrous. At best, it satisfies neither side. And if you employ it with a counterpart who has a win-lose approach, you're setting yourself up to be swindled. So don't compromise. Uh, this chapter with the whole bend, the, kind of the, the context of the book, the background is you're going to be basing how you're interacting off of emotion instead of logic. Um, so this whole bend your reality, bend their reality is part of that. Uh, all right, so uh, deadlines, all right? So time is one of the most crucial variables in any negotiation. Simple passing of time and its sharper cousin, the deadline are the screw that pressures every deal to conclusion. Uh, what good negotiators do is force themselves to resist the urge and take advantage of it in others, right? So the whole time pressure, which is in many negotiation books, is uh, leveraged here, talked about here. One of the, one of the uh, ideas that he pushes forward is throughout his negotiation, whenever there was a, imposed a deadline and, and kind of, it's interesting because you want to apply everything that he is saying, he's talking about negotiations where someone is threatening to cut off an ear or kill someone, those types of things, which he's gone through actually a lot of kind of, he was in a situation where he was going through a negotiation every week where someone kidnapped someone and threatened to kill them if they didn't get a ransom. So um, he's talking about these time deadlines. One of the things he said was <laughs> they really don't apply. And it's interesting because if they don't apply in if they don't, if they're not actually really hard dates in negotiation where someone's going to be killed, but probably not often hard dates in the business setting as well. He challenged 
a um, his students that were kind of within the realm of business, have they ever, um, or to give an example of a real deadline that had real consequences and he's, and he's received only a very few real examples where the consequences happen, which is counterintuitive because we can all think of a negotiation where someone says, yeah, if we don't meet this, then you don't get this contract or something like that. So he kind of pushes back on that. One of the things that's like, read this out. So how close are we getting to the self-imposed deadline would be indicated by how specific the threats were that they issued. So he's saying how they teased out the, what he calls the counterparts of the person you're negotiating, negotiating with. When the threats became more specific, then they, they were able to receive more information so give us the money or your aunt is going to die is an early stage threat as the time isn't specified. Increasing specificity on threats in any type of negotiation indicates getting closer to the real consequences at a real specified time. So that is a takeaway here. Very specific consequences, they use the term threats, but very specific, then you're getting closer to the real time. To gauge the level of, uh, of a particular threat, we pay attention to how many of our questions, the what, who, when, and how were addressed. When people issue threats, they consciously or subconsciously create ambiguities and loopholes they fully intend to exploit. As the loopholes started to close, as the week progressed and did so over and over again in similar ways with different kidnappings, the pattern emerged, and this is, um, how they were figuring out patterns of these weekly kidnappings that they were dealing with. He's talking about in Haiti is where this was happening. So talking about time um, pressure, uh, corporate salespeople work on a quarterly basis and are most vulnerable as a quarter comes to a close. Something to remember for us. Deadlines cut both ways. So you can talk about time pressure on your counterpart, the other person you're negotiating with, they can have a deadline and you also can have a deadline. Um, deadlines, well, he's saying cuts both ways. So um, when someone, let, let's read this out. So uh, Deadlines cut in both ways. Cohen may well have been nervous about what his boss would say if he left Japan without an agreement. But it's also true that Cohen's counterparts wouldn't have won if he left without a deal. That's the key when negotiator or when the negotiation is over for one side, it's over for, for the other too. Whenever there's a negotiation, both sides want to get something. Otherwise, you wouldn't even have been at the table. So when someone says there's a deadline kind of, you, you may want to say, oh, that creates time pressure for one side over the other, but it actually creates time pressure for both. Here's something else that's kind of counterintuitive. The hiding a deadline actually puts the negotiator in the worst possible position. So this is talking about if you have a deadline and you don't tell the other about it. So you may want to say, I don't want to create time pressure on myself. I want to act like I have all the time in the world, right? So in the research, uh, you found that hiding your own deadlines dramatically increases the risk of an impasse. That's because having a deadline pushes you to speed up your concessions. But the other side, thinking that it has time, will just hold out for more. So this is counterintuitive truth here. More discovered that when negotiators tell their counterparts about their deadline, they get better deals. It's true. First, by revealing your cutoff, you reduce the risk of impasse. And second, when the opponent knows your deadline, he'll get to the real deal and concession making more quickly. Uh, he's talking about the, he goes through talking about the ultimatum game. Uh, we talked about this in other um, reviews a long time ago. Uh, but basically, um, he, this is a game that he played with his, uh, with his students. 
and trying to tease out um, offers and and talking about fairness. So this section is talking about fairness and uh, taking the that really isn't a such thing as fair. And he teases out what he means by that. So let's talk a little, a little bit about the ultimate game. It goes like this. After students split into pairs of a proposer and an acceptor, he gives a proposer $10. The proposer then has to offer the acceptor a round number of dollars. If the acceptor agrees, he or she receives what's been offered and the proposer gets the rest. If the acceptor refuses, the offer, uh, though they both get nothing and a $10 goes back to the uh, author. Right, so this game I know offhand is the most studied game. It's also called the dictator game in behavioral ec economics. They've done it in just about every single type of um, society uh, and culture with different ranging amount of uh, money, ranging up to a month's worth of, of pay uh, for the average person and all this type of stuff like that. Um, so one of the things you would uh, when we notice with the offers with his own um, tests uh, is that the offers that are given. So remember in a dictator game, if you got ten dollars, you're the dictator. You can say, "Hey, I'll give you five dollars, uh, and I'll keep five dollars." How's that? And if they say yes, you both get the five dollars. They can also say, "I'll give you one dollar. I'm keeping nine." They could also say that, right? And if they say no, if the receiver says no, neither of you get the money. Well, one of the things is that no split was chosen far more than any other. So this is different than what was accepted. This is what was offered. What was offered is not, there isn't a pattern to it. So you have people who will do something where they really try to exploit and there's people who don't, whatever, right? Uh, the, the, what is accepted is that is um, actually 50, 50 versus, you know, I think the range is somewhere around um, 70, 30 is when people start saying no, but what's offered, you can find out all of the place. Now, why does that matter? It teases out what you can, you may think like what he's saying, you may think that someone else will do the same type of offer you would, but you shouldn't think that that comes into play when, what he, when we get into what he's calling anchoring or someone you could, uh, think of what is commonly called like low balling or high balling or that kind of thing. Someone giving you a really high or low offer. Um, you should go ahead and expect that people will do that. Let's go down here. So fairness can, can be very triggering. The most powerful word in negoti negotiations is fair. As human beings, we're mightily swayed by how much we feel we have been respected. People comply with agreements if they feel they've been treated fairly and lash out if they don't. Years of experience has shown me that the most acceptors will invariably reject any offer that is less than half of the proposer's money. Once you get to a quarter of the proposer's money, you can forget it and the acceptors are insulted. So. Um, he goes through talking about Iran and stuff like that. There are three ways that people drop the F bomb, which is fairness bomb. Only one is positive. Um, the most common is a judo like defensive mood that stabilizes the other side. This manipulation takes the form of something like we just want it what is fair. So if someone is negotiating with you and they say, we just want what is fair, the best response is, uh, is to take a deep breath and restrain your desire to concede. Then say, okay, I apologize. Let's stop everything and go back to where I started treating you unfairly 
and will fix it. So if someone's accusing you of failure, you can turn around and say that. Um, it's implying that that's actually a manipulation. So the second use of the fairness, let's say we've given you a fair offer and it's terribly, uh, and it's a terrible little jab meant to distract your attention and manipulate you into giving. Um, if you kind of think of things like that. Uh, that I'm experienced with. Okay, so you, one of the, the responses could be using a mirror, which we talked about in the last um, review of the book. Uh, fair, you'd respond, pausing to let the words power to do them as it was intended to do to you. Follow that with a label. It seems like you're ready to provide the evidence that supports that, which alludes to opening their books or otherwise handing over information that will either contradict their claim to fairness or give you more data to work with than you previously. Right away, you declaw the attack. So fair, tying it to evidence, that's kind of a response to that. If someone says something is fair. But the last way is, is honest. What he's saying is honest. So early on in the negotiation, I want you to say, oh, he says, I say, I want you to feel like you are being treated fairly at all times. Please stop me at any time if you feel that I'm being unfair and we will address it. That's another way to use this term. All right, so let's move forward. Emotional drivers behind what the other party values. If you can get the other party to reveal their problems, pain, and unmet objectives, you can get at what people are really buying. Then you can sell them a vision of their problem that leaves your proposal as the perfect solution. This pain-driven selling, our favorite. So now, the bending of the reality. Uh, going back into, he starts talking a bit about game experience prospect theory, which is um, kind of the limits of boundaries of game theory. So he talks about the certainty effect. Um, uh, people are drawn to sure things over probabilities, even when the probability is a better choice. It's called the certainty effect. And people will take great greater risk to avoid losses than to achieve goals. That's called loss aversion. In a tough negotiation, it's not enough to show the other party that you can deliver things they want. To get real leverage, you have to persuade them that they have something concrete to lose if the deal falls through. Okay, so now one of the main components in this bending of the reality, we've got a bunch of things to go over here. Anchoring. So this is lowballing, highballing, these types of things. Anchoring, how you set things. So to bend your counterpart's reality, you have to start with the basics of empathy to start out with an accusation audit acknowledging all of their fears by anchoring anchoring their emotions in uh, preparation for a loss you inflame the other side's loss aversion so that they'll jump at the chance to avoid it so this is kind of the he talks about this and we went over this in the previous um first half of the book but um lawyers do this all the time they'll do an opening statement and say my client is not perfect. He cheated on his wife. He did this and that, but he's not a murderer, right? So um, he gives an example of a real world example where he said, I got a lousy proposition for you. And um, he ended up saying how he couldn't pay certain people what they were promised and he ended up being able to um, uh, frame it in such a way as uh, he'll have to go with with other people who will take the, the lesser amount of the pay. It ended up being, um, ended up working. Uh, let the other guy go first. Most of the time, this is kind of getting the other person to give the offer first. And um, one of the things he puts out there is because anchoring anchoring is so powerful and um when you anchor and you do the low ball high ball these things 
somebody that he's calling a shark, but an experienced negotiator, they are going to be able to manage anchoring better than someone who's not. And he's going to talk about it, but you're going to have to be able to receive. If you let other people go first, you're going to have to be able to basically take a punch. Um, one of the things he says when you are, so you want to say, let's say you're negotiating for salary, it's best to just give a range. So if you know you want to get paid 80000 a year and it's for a business analyst or something, you should say between 80000 to one ten, right, with the bottom being what it is that you want or something like that. And that's uh, backed up by studies as far as um, getting the a good anchor, a good uh, to start out negotiation. One of the things, you know, another thing is uh, these are like pivot to non-monetary terms and surprise with a gift. So to bend your counterpart's reality to your point of view, pivot to a non-monetary term. I've always thought of this as um, the way that employers talk about benefits. So they could say healthcare, they could say time off, they can say all of that when you're negotiating salary. And uh, for myself, I've always said that all your benefits are worth about $10 an hour, you know. Uh, but they can do that and end up paying you, you know, much less than that. So uh, that's something to think about this non-monetary term and it's saying you do anything to uh, always use odd numbers psychologically so 30,263 instead of you know 37,200 or 2,002 for some reason odd numbers work better surprise with a gift um Offering a wholly unrelated surprise gift. So this could be anything. You'd get creative with it. An article, writing something for somebody, things like that. He talks about um, him uh, coaching business schools. Uh, evidently, business schools get a higher ranking if their graduate if their graduates are compensated higher so he went in and was actually coaching them how to get better um compensation and uh it's part i mean these are basically just good examples of something that the everyday person wants to do um be pleasantly persistent on non-salary terms the more you talk about non-salary uh, terms, the more likely you are to hear the full range of their options. So this is teasing out information. Sal salary terms without success is, is Russian roulette. So this is a this is I found this to be really uh, insightful. Make sure to define a success for your position as well as metrics for your next raise. It's meaningful you meaningful for you and uh, free for your boss. Right. So basically you would say, what is it, what is it, what does it look like for me? What would success look like for me in six months? Kind of thing. Um, also tie your success to um, their success. So, you know, you get an advocate, get a member. So what is the, the uh, question is, what does it take like to be successful here? And the, again, this is a calibrated question. So what and how versus why? Let's get through here. So here's some key lessons. Um, all negotiations are, are defined by a network of subterranean desires and needs. Don't let yourself be fooled by the surface once you know the like the, he, this is what he was doing, Haitian negotiation, negotiating with Haitian kidnappers every week. Um, but he figured, figured out that they just wanted party money. So when they would ask for $75,000, they really only wanted like $4,000. Uh, splitting the difference is wearing one black shoe and one brown shoe. 
approaching deadlines entice people to rush the negotiating process and do impulsive things that are against their best interests. Fair is an emotional term people usually uh, explo exploit to put the other side on the defensive and gain concessions. You can bend your counter counterpart's reality by anchoring his starting point and people will take more risks to avoid a loss and realize a gain. So any questions about this chapter? Let's see. All right. Nope. Open this thing up. All right. I think this chapter had a lot in it. All right, this chapter, this is, he was going over uh, this group, the, the Dos Palmas that were in the Philippines. They seemed to be pretty brutal. They, they would threaten, they would take a lot, they would kidnap a lot of people and they would kill them if you didn't, you know, pay up, if you didn't listen. And they were very much getting on, they had access to get on the news. It, they created a really hostile situation between them and the military in the Philippines. And it was just a no-win situation. Um, lots of people would get killed in a spectacular fashion. And, uh, you know, Americans as well, which is how, you know, the FBI would get involved. But they were in a situation where they weren't able to control the negotiation. So it was just a bad just bad all around. Uh, one, the um, reoccurring theme is uh, trying to deal with people that aren't directly in front of you when you're negotiating. So he talks a bunch about that. We're gonna, We'll come back to it. This was in insightful. So a change in negotiators by the other side almost always signaled that they meant to take a harder line. So when somebody new comes in, expect them to be, it's kind, it's kind of, well, he, he would say a harder line. To me, I want to say bad news, but he's a negotiator, so he just looks at it differently. Um. He's, this is some of their learning process. This Philippines uh, engagements, they were pivotal in changing how they were um, uh, doing their negotiation. So they stopped. Um, one of the things that they stopped doing was, um, I want to say this is when they, when they started trying to get one of the situations one of the things that uh, occurs often is you want to get proof of life and there's, so how do you get that? And when you, when you ask for it, you can automatically, when they give you something, there's a, there's a implied need for reciprocation. And they used to be scared of that. Um, so part of that that created these dynamics that uh, were difficult for them to, to deal with. And so this is kind of what I was talking about. The big reason we had no effective influence with the kidnappers and hostages was that we had this very tit for tat mentality under that mentality. If we called up the bad guys, we were asking for something. And if they gave it to us, we had to give them something back. And this fear was a major flaw in our mindset. There is some information that you can only get through direct extended interactions with your counterpart. Keep in mind, this is as late as 2001, I think, or 2000 when this was going on. So they've changed just in the past 20 years. Um, let's see here. So this is one of the uh, parts when they when they started changing. All right. Well, 
well, I don't have it here, but basically this is a funny story. So evidently there was a situation in Pittsburgh where one drug dealer kidnapped another drug dealer's girlf girlfriend and then the other drug dealer kidnapped the first drug dealer's girlfriend. So the first drug dealer went to the FBI and said, help me. And so they're driving around trying to uh, get the girlfriend back. And while he was listening, this is Chris Voss, while he's listening, the first drug dealer says, um, that you know, so they're trying to negotiate and they need proof of life. And, and they, again, historically, they would do all of this. We need a video, we need some type of I put her on the phone, whatever, right? Instead of you asking to put on the phone, he said, How do I know that she's still alive? And we're talking about his own girlfriend. And so, this it's a how question so it's a calibrated question it makes the other the counterpart go into problem solving mode and he answered well i'll put her on the phone so this changed how fbi does their uh um let's say proof of life part of the negotiation they do a calibrated question uh and this kind of made it was kind of the uh the light bulb going off right so what problems does it solve um you don't owe the kidnapper anything the guy volunteers to put the girlfriend on the phone he thinks it's his idea the guy who, the guy who just offered to put the girlfriend on the line thinks he's in control and the secret to gaining the upper hand in negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control the genius of this technique is really well explained by something that psychologist Kevin Dutton says in his book, Split Second Persuasion. He talks about what he calls unbelief, which is active resistance to what the other side is saying, complete rejection. That's where the two parties in a negotiation usually start. So you start in this mode of complete rejection. If you ever get off that dynamic, you end up having shutdowns. Each side tries to to impose its point of view. You get two hard skulls banging against each other like in Dos Palmos, the group that was the Philippines. But if you can get the other side to drop their unbelief, you can slowly work them to your point of view on the back of their energy, just like the drug dealer's question got the kidnapper to volunteer to do what the drug dealer wanted. You don't directly wanna persuade them to see your ideas. Instead, you ride them to your ideas. Giving your counterpart the illusion of control by asking calibrated questions, by asking for help, is one of the most powerful tools for suspending unbelief. That's a big takeaway from the book. So calibrate your questions. We talked about calibrated questions in the last portion, but we're going to just review some more. The real beauty of a calibrated question is the fact that they offer no target for attack. Like statements do, calibrated questions have power to educate your counterpart on what the problem is, rather than causing conflict by telling them what the problem is. First off, calibrated questions avoid verbs or words like can, is, are, do, or does. These are closed-ended questions that can be answered with a simple yes or a no. Instead, they start with a list of words people know as reporters questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those words inspire counterpart to think. But let me, let me, let's cut the list even further. Start with what and how, and sometimes why, nothing else. The, and then with why, just basically don't use why. Just forget it. Why is like a burner on a hot stove, don't touch it. So leave it alone. What and how, there's one trick to why that he talks about it uh, later on, we, maybe we'll get to it, but it's very targeted. So some examples, um, you can use what or how to calibrate nearly any question. Does this look like something you would like, right? So you're not supposed to use the word does, can become, how does this look to you? And what about this works for you? You can even ask, what about this doesn't work for you, right? And you, you're getting information. Either something as harsh as why did you do it 
can be compared to what caused you to do it, which takes away the emotion and makes the question less accusatory. Accusatory. So there are a few. Uh, what's the biggest challenge you face? Is one of those questions to um, tease out the uh, early uh, things, more information early in a negotiation. What about this is important to you? How can I help to make this better for us? So these are good, really good questions for uh, in the business mindset, negotiating and trying to tease out some things that you want to do for another person. How would you like me to proceed? What is that? What is it that brought us into this situation? How can we solve this problem? What's the objective? What are we trying to accomplish here? How am I supposed to do that? The implication calibrated question is that you want what the other guy wants, but you need his intelligence to overcome the problem. This, this really appeals to very aggressive or egotistical counterparts. So again, making them feel the illusion of control. Let's skip down here. Key lessons. Uh, who has control in the conversation, the guy listening or the guy talking? It's the listener. And the listeners, the talker is the one revealing information. While it's the listener, if he's trained well, is directing the conversation towards his own goals. Don't try to force the opponent to admit that you're right. Avoid questions that can be answered with yes or tiny pieces of information. These require a little thought inspire the human need for reciprocity. You will be expected to give something back. Ask calibrated questions that start with the words how or what. Don't ask questions that start with why unless you want your counterpart to defend a goal that serves you. Why is always an accusation in any language. Calibrate your questions to point your counterpart towards solving your problem. Bite your tongue when you're attacked in a negotiation. Pause and avoid angry emotional reactions. There's always a team on the other side. If you're not influenced, those uh, behind the table, you are vulnerable. So any questions? We're going to develop this whole thing a little more the next. Okay, so this is going to actually build on what we what we were just reviewing. Your job as a negotiator isn't just to get to an agreement. It's getting one that can be implemented and making sure that happens. So essentially this statement, yes is nothing without how. That's the basis of this chapter. Yes is nothing without how. An agreement is nice, the contract is better, a signed check is best. You don't get to your profits with the agreement, they come upon implementation. So this is linked calibrated questions, the how, so you're getting a yes without the how, it's nothing, right? This is linked into the part of the negotiation. Calibrated how questions are a surefire way to keep negotiations going. They put the pressure on your counterpart to come up with the answers and to contemplate your problems then making when making their demands. The trick to how question is that correctly used, they're gentle and graceful ways to say no guide your counterpart to develop a better solution your solution let's see there are two key questions you can ask to push your counterpart to think they are defining success their way how will we know we're on track and how will we address things if we find we're off track when they answer, summarize their answers until you get to that's right. So that's right, it's chapter five. That's where this is the gold. Is them saying that's right. They'll know uh, that they bought in. So how we know they're on track, how we're off track, you get them to say that's right. So uh, when they say you're right, it's often a good indicator they are. When they say you're right, it's often a good indicator they are not vested. And this again, this counter to the principled negotiation technique to getting the yes your right is like getting a yes or getting best no you take a position opposite position and when you push for implementation and they say i'll try 
you should be shitting feeling in your stomach because this really means I plan to fail. When you hear either of these, go back into the cal calibrated how questions. All right, let's go down here. This, I want to say, is stuff that we've come up against a lot. Stuff so can be teased out, studied, something to review again. Uh, how do you influence people who aren't across the table from you, but they are what he calls deal breakers? Um, they have power, but they're, but you're not talking to the right of them. So a few hostage takers and few business deal makers fly solo. But for the most part, there are almost always other players, people who can act as deal makers or deal killers. If you truly want to get to yes and your uh, and get your deal implemented, you have to discover how to affect those individuals. So some questions. How does this affect the rest of your team? Or how on board are the people not on this call? Or simply, what do your colleagues see as their main challenges in this area? These are questions that we can try to implement. Um, he gave an example where he didn't implement some of these and had a loss. Um, so he's saying that we could have avoided all that had we asked a few calibrated questions like how does this affect everybody else? How on board is the rest of your team? How do we make sure we deliver the right material to the right people? How do we ensure that managers of those we're training are fully on board? So this is actually a really good example because um, I mean, just within tech or whatever, because if you're you're doing training often, and so sometimes the people that are on board checking on a call, uh, they can be the deal breaker, the deal killer, and saying, "Oh, you know, no, we, we don't want that training," or you know, they just by the fact that they weren't consulted about the training, they'll they could deny it, right? So getting them to at least float those questions to other people can get the buy-in to forestall the uh, deal killers. He has a chapter on spotting liars that I found was, I found it, I'm not chapter, but a section. It was kind of interesting, just more calibrated questions is uh, doing the how question. Um, Open-ended how questions is one of the main ways. Let's see here. Yeah, let's go ahead. So this this is interesting. The 7, 38, 55% rule is kind of an argument for talking to people in person. So only 7% of a message is based on the words, on the words you're saying. Well, 38% comes from the tone of voice and 55% from the speaker's body language and face. So argument for Zoom goals, I guess, with the view on. Body language and tone of voice, not words, are our most powerful assessment tools. That's why you'll often fly a great space to face to face. All right, so here's an example. Um, when their tone of voice or body language does not line, so say, so we're agreed and them saying yes. And this kind of creates some hesitation. So I heard you say yes, but it seemed like there was hesitation in your voice. Them, oh, it's nothing really. And you, no, this is important. Let's make sure we get this right. And then them saying, thanks, I appreciate it. So this is kind of some put some kind of reasoning about body language and tone of voice that needs to be done. And you can't do that, obviously, if you're doing it over text or not in front of them. So rule of three, we talked about the three kinds of yes in the last um, uh, review. So here's a, a rule of three. And I want to say this is part of teasing out. Yeah, it's part of teasing out the line. So the rule of three is like the other person to agree to the same thing three times in the same conversation. 
it's tripling the strength of whatever dynamic you're trying to drill in at the moment. In doing so, it uncovers problems before they happen. It's really hard to repeatedly lie or fake conviction if you get people to say something three times. The first time they agree to something or give you a commitment, that's number one. For number two, you might label or summarize what they said. So they answer, that's right. And then number three could be a calibrated how or what question about implementation and ask them to explain what they will constitute, what, what will constitute success. Something like, what will we do if we get off track? This, I've found it to be, I think, really important because, again, one side of this is getting, even though there's a kind of a, you can have a tacit agreement or you can have kind of have a weak agreement getting someone to agree three times also can get them to go and to talk to the deal breakers that are behind the scenes. Also, you can tease out the outcome of the plan. Uh, and then these, this way of implementing it, we don't have it here, but he said, you know, one of the issues you could be getting somebody to repeat something three times, you can sound like a broken record. Here's the So, Labeling and summarizing is number is number two, and then calibrated how. So we're going back, always going back these calibrated questions. So the implementation part, that's a third. And then it doesn't sound like the broken records. So this is kind of one of the things that's definitely a big, a big home. Um, Pinocchio effect. So liars use more words than truth tellers. And uh, they also say, him, her, with their pronouns, don't use I, it's him, her. So again, this is talking about negotiation. So somebody thinks they think probably might not true. That could be, that could be like what their budget is, right? That kind of thing. They are in charge of the budget or they're not in charge of the budget. So this, this um, also is related to that. So let's say you're talking about somebody who's saying, well, you're saying, what's the budget and you don't know if they're in charge of it, like increasing it, decrease, whatever, or, you know, what the actual budget is kind of thing. When they say I and me and my, it's the opposite. So that means they're not important. If they're saying I'm the one that sets the budget, I'm the, they don't. When they say someone else, so he, them, you know, she, or what have you, they don't use I, they actually are more important. It's the opposite. Um, so, you know, some rule. Um, this is, is this the trick? All right. No, this is the, so basically get them to say no four times in a row. When somebody, this is getting more into specific bidding and he's going to expound on this some more but um so you gotta if someone says let's say that you want eighty thousand per year for salary or something like that and they are offering you fifty thousand so you want to say no four times in order to get to get them higher up to 80, if that makes sense. So the first step in the no series is how am I supposed to do that? So this applies to negotiation of salary and only talks more specifically about it later. But um, you've got to, like, how am I supposed to do that? It's kind of, you're wanting to put that on, on the other side so it may be in this situation it could be that you have a family whatever how am i supposed to do take fifty thousand that kind of thing um then you could say your offer is very generous i'm sorry that just doesn't work for me that's the second um stage of no and then you can use something like i'm sorry but i'm afraid i just can't do that it's a little more direct and it can't do the um uh and I can't, I can't do that. It does a, uh, it does a double duty by expressing an inability to perform and it can trigger the other side's empathy for you. And then alas, is I'm sorry, no is a slightly more succinct version for the fourth no. 
if delivered gently, it barely sounds negative at all. So this is kind of trying to go down four, you know, this would be something you need to practice, but you can go down saying four, saying no four times in a row without sounding, without shutting everything down. So key lessons, yes is nothing without how. That's something to remember if you don't remember anything else about this chapter. Ask calibrated how questions, ask them again and again. Asking how keeps your counterpart engaged but off balance. Use how questions to shape the negotiating environment. You do this by using how can I do that as a gentle version of no. Don't just pay attention to the people you're negotiating with. Always identify motivations of the players behind the table. Uh, follow the 7, 38, and 55% rule by paying close attention to the tone of voice and body language. Is the yes real or counterfeit? Test it with the rule of three. Use calibrated question summaries and labels to get your counterpart to reaffirm the agreement at least three times. It's really hard to repeatedly lie. I really think that this is important to internalize. A person's use of pronouns offers deep in insights into his or her a relative authority. And use your own name. We didn't go over this, but use your own name to make yourself a real person on the other side. That's in situations where it's kind of an in, in, impromptu negotiation. So any questions? Chapter eight. Got about 10 minutes. This chapter nine is kind of what he calls getting down to the brass tacks. So this is the hardcore your bargaining chapter. A big Big part of this is opening offers and that anchoring and all this stuff like that. Uh, they, okay, yes. I put a bunch in here about the three types of negotiators. So this is fun. This is small. So, you know, do you say that there's a lot of analysis into negotiation and psychology and he said and he went through and kind of broke it down into these three so analyst accommodator assertive these three and we've seen this in other negotiation books that we reviewed but um it's more simplified so analysts are Methodical and diligent, they are not in a big rush. Instead, they believe that as long as they are working towards the best result in a thorough and systematic way, time is of little consequence. Their self-image is linked to minimizing mistakes. Their motto, as much time as it takes to get right. Accommodator, the most important thing to this type of negotiator is the time spent building the relationship. Accommodators stay as long as there's a free flowing continuous exchange of information time is being well spent as long as they're communicating they're happy their goal is to be on great terms with their counterpart they love the win-win assertive the assertive type believes time is money every wasted minute is a wasted dollar their self-image is linked to how many things they can get accomplished in a period of time for them getting the solution perfect isn't as important as getting it done let's take a look at some of the takeaways. If you're an analyst, you should be worried about cutting yourself off from the, the an essential source of data, your counterpart. The single biggest thing you can do is to smile when you think or well, speak. People will be more forthcoming with information as a result. Smiling can also become a habit that makes it easy for you to mask any moments you've been caught off guard. This section is good to read just in depth. Um, if you see yourself in here, it's good to, to review, to see some pros and cons because, um, and we're going to see some of the outcomes of the three, um, when they clash, uh, for the accommodator, if you have identified yourself as accommodator, stick to your ability to be very likable, but do not sacrifice objections. Not only do the other two types need to hear your point of view, if you're dealing with another accommodator, they will welcome it. Also be conscious of excess chit chat. The other two types have no use for it. And if you're sitting across the table from someone like yourself, you will be prone to interactions where nothing gets done. All right, and assertive. If you're an assertive, 
Be particularly conscious of your tone. You will not intend to be overly harsh, but you will often come off that way. And intentionally soften your tone and work to make it more pleasant. Use calibrated questions and labels with your counterparts since that will also make you more approachable and increase the chances for collaboration. You've seen how each of these groups of the importance of time differently. Um, so for the analyst, time equals preparation. For the accommodator, time equals relationship. And for the time equals money, they have a completely different interpretation of silence. The funny thing is when they cross over, an analyst pauses to think, right? So during time, the, the analyst pauses to think. Their accommodator counterpart gets nervous and an assertive one starts talking, thereby annoying the analyst who thinks to herself, every time I try to think, you take that as an opportunity to talk more. Won't you ever shut up? Like this, and he has a couple of examples in this kind of humorous. Uh, this taking a punch, all of these, this is kind of a big takeaway. So let's go over it quick. Taking a punch is when they do the big counter offer with a low ball, high ball, that called a punch in the face. And it's also called anchoring. Experienced negotiators often lead with a ridiculous offer, an extreme anchor. And if you're not prepared to handle it, you'll lose your moorings and immediately go to your maximum. Okay, a well, let's just go, let's move through here. You can also respond to a punch in the face anchor by simply pivoting into turn. What I mean by this is that when you feel you're being dragged into a haggle, you can detour the conversation to the non-monetary issues that make any final price work. All right, punching back, use assertion without getting used by it. All right, so there's different uh, pieces in here and these are getting more nuanced. So anger controlling your anger types of thing. When someone puts out a ridiculous offer, one that really pisses you off, take a deep breath, allow a little anger, allow a little anger and channel it at the proposal, out of the person and say, I don't see how that would ever work. Such a well-timed offense taking known as a strategic umbrage can wake your counterpart to the problem. In studies by Columbia University, uh, people on the receiving end of strategic umbrage were more likely to rate themselves as over assertive, even when the counterpart didn't think so. The real lesson here is being aware of how this might be used on you. Please don't allow yourself to fall victim to strategic umbrage. Something to remember. Why questions? Here, the only time that I've found where he, he, it seems like the why question would be kind of a trick that you would want to remember. The basic format goes like this. When you want to flip a dubious counterpart to your side, ask them, why would you do that? But in a way that favors you. If you're so here, if you're working to lure a client away from a competitor, you might say, why would you ever do business with me? Why would you ever change from your existing supplier? They're great. This is like reverse psychology in a way. Right? In these questions, the why, uh, of course, is your uh, sub, uh, counterpart into working with you. All right, so I messages, this, these are all about emotion and kind of channeling anger. When you say, so remember before you take I out, but now here you want it in. When you say, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me, the word I strategically, focuses your counterpart's attention on you long enough for you to make a point that additional I messages to use the I to hit the pause button to step out of a bad dynamic, right? Um, and you need to have this walk away mindset. It's just tough, kind of tough to have, but Ackerman bargaining. So this is good for whenever planning ever again, come in and take a look at this. Set your first offer at 65% of the target price. So essentially um, we're between 65% of, of where the target is. So if you wanted to get to, I think, 
let's say you're the employer and you wanted to get them to a hundred thousand, right? So you're the employer, you want them, you want to hire them at a hundred thousand. You start out at 65,000. So that's going to be, this is rules of thumb, this, this bargain method and all this stuff. That's going to be, you want to plan this out before you do anything. And that's going to be your kind of really your punch to them. And you're going to allow them to respond, all the stuff, all that stuff like that. And then calculate three raises for decreasing implements, in decreasing implements, uh, increments, sorry. So then you would go to 85,000 and 95,000 and then 100,000 as the conversation goes back and forth. So this is essentially how you do this method and they use it to great effect. So this is kind of the brass tacks talking about how in the world are you going to negotiate when it comes to this bargaining back and forth. Uh, key lessons, identify their negotiating style know the correct way to approach them after that. Prepare, so prepare is Ackerman bargaining. When the pressure's on, you don't want to raise, you don't want to rise to occasion. You fall to your highest level of preparation. So design an ambitious but legitimate goal and then game out the label. So this is all that stuff. Get ready to take a punch, right? So before you even go in, know that they're going to do, let's just imagine that they do this to you. You know you're worth 100,000. The employer comes in and says, yeah, here's 65,000 for you. It's going to be a gut punch. Be ready. Um, set boundaries. Learn to take a punch or punch back without, without anger, right? Now, remember that you do have ways to strategically use anger, and there, those are there. Um, prepare the Ackerman plan. And before you head into the weeds of bargaining, you need a plan of extreme anchor, calibrated questions, so on and so forth, right? Um, the black swan, this is essentially, I just put the key lessons in here, is essentially every negotiation has stuff that you don't know about. And the whole process of calibrated questions and all that stuff is really trying to get all those black swans, the things that you just could not, the unknown unknowns, all of that, teasing those out so you don't get blindsided. So there we go. Any questions?